First, I didn't think we'd have any young disciples, and you all are here, and it's great to see each of you this morning. Hi there. Well, I'm Pastor Carl, and I um, want to tell you what the adults and I are going to be thinking about later today when the sermon. We're thinking about Jesus and what he calls his upside down kingdom. Can you say that? Upside down kingdom. Now, this means that what Jesus tells us often is upside down. It's like, does not make sense? Jesus, what do you mean? He says things like, if you want to win, you got to lose. If you want to be first, you got to be last. If you want to be the leader, you got to serve everybody. What does that mean? It's upside down. It makes no sense at all. Or does it? I want to give you each something to think about. This is for you to keep. It's just a little something I want to tell you about. And then you can talk with your parents about it later. It's just a little picture I found on the internet. And I think it captures what I want to tell the, the adults about. There you go. And you take a look at it while I pass it out. And you tell me the two things you see. There are two things on here. Don't tell me yet. But tell me it w when I ask you in just a second. They're kind of, here there you go. And let's see. There you go. All right, and you get one too. Everybody get one? Okay. What two things do you see on the picture? A crown and a cross. Very good. She jumped right in. A crown and a cross. That's right. There's a cross, and then there's a crown sitting on it. And then there's a statement beneath it. Can anybody here read? Could you read it for us? No cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. Now, let's just remember that for a, a crown, who wears a crown? A king, right? A king wears a crown. And usually a king who has a crown is strong and powerful. But you know what? A cross, cross is for the weak people who are dying. Those are for criminals and other people who are being punished. And so we have this crown, strong, and a cross, weak. And this is what we're talking about today, the upside down kingdom. So here's what it means. If you go to school and you see someone and you want to maybe have a running race with them or play some game with them and you really want to beat them, well, that's, that's normal to want that. But sometimes you might want to think twice and think, maybe I'll let them win. Or maybe I'll help this person and, and, and focus on them and not on me. And when you do that, you're doing upside down work, the work of Jesus. So I want you to think about the crown and the cross. The cross is a symbol of suffering and the crown is a symbol of glory. And if you don't have a cross, you won't get a crown. So suffering leads to glory. So when we go through difficult times, we can know that God can redeem it, use it for good. Let me pray for you. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for these young disciples, for all that you're teaching them in a variety of ways. Help them to draw closer to you in this season we call Lent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, you guys. See you later. And there are more of those handouts for adults if they want them. Come see me after the service. Well, before we begin the message this morning, a couple items I wanted to share with you. A lot of you know about my mother. My mom is battling stage four cancer. Started in her lungs, now it's all over her body. And Rupali and I went last week to see my mom and my dad in Southern California. Mom is in a good, stable place for now. She's not in any pain. She's, uh, she's able to have a conversation for about 15 minutes and she's got to lie down. But we're really glad we saw her and would ask that you continue to pray for her and for my dad. Also, I want you to know about Holy Week. If you don't know what's coming, let me tell you. Maundy Thursday, Thursday before Easter Sunday, the 17th. So back up, I'm not sure of the date. It's, yeah, I have it, 14th. Maundy Thursday, in the chapel, 7 p.m., is a praise and worship service and communion that Joe Cutshaw will be leading. It's going to be in more of a contemporary flavor. The next night, Good Friday, the 15th, we're going to have a tenebrae service here in the uh, sanctuary. And um, we've designed the service around the Marshall Fire to help us think about the collective suffering we as a community have gone through as an entryway into identifying with Jesus and having him identify with us. 
Uh, it's going to be a personal time, uh, a moving time, I think. And if you have neighbors or friends who have been affected by the Marshall Fire, you might want to invite them. I think it would be appropriate to do that. All right, that's enough uh, announcements. Let's get into the sermon. And let me remind you that we are in a sermon series called The Upside Down Kingdom, like I mentioned to the kids. And we are going to look at a hard saying of Jesus. And we're going to look at Matthew 16, beginning at verse 21. Let's take a look at it. Jesus, uh, rather Matthew, tells us this. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, would you now, by your Holy Spirit, take this written word so ancient and make it contemporary in our ears and in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, I think it's fair to say that Jesus wasn't very good at sales and marketing. I mean, if you want to win friends and influence people, if you want to start a successful global movement that's for all people, at all times, in all places, would you do it the way Jesus did? Start with a questionable pedigree and be born to an unwed mother in a manger in Bethlehem, basically homeless? Begin your childhood as a refugee in Egypt? Grow up in backwater Galilee as a blue-collar worker? Get baptized with a bunch of sinners in the Jordan River? Hang out with rejects and shady ladies, touch lepers, welcome outcasts, embrace foreigners, forgive enemies? If you're Messiah, is this what you do? Speak truth to power? Disrespect the religious elite and the power brokers in Jerusalem? Hire uneducated fishermen as your senior VPs? Who does this? Then would you say things like, blessed, happy are the poor in spirit? Why not bless the rich and the rich in spirit? Say things like, blessed, happy are those who mourn. Why not bless the optimistic, the positive thinkers, the upbeat? Say things like, blessed, happy are the peacemakers. Why not bless the winners who get their way at all costs, who destroy the opposition and put themselves first at all costs? But that's not Jesus. Everything Jesus said and did was upside down. Want to gain your life? Lose it. Want to be rich in heaven? Give away your stuff on earth. Want to win? Lose. Want to live? Die. Want to lead? Serve. Want to be first? Be last. You want glory? Suffer. You want a crown? Take up your cross. This isn't worldly wisdom. At least not if you want to promote and market a global establishment. Jesus' way is so counterintuitive, so contrary to the ways of the world, to self-help books and the guidance of social media influencers, that maybe, just maybe, it's true. Because we can't make this stuff up. It's the upside-down kingdom. Some of you remember Dale Bruner. Dale Bruner came and spoke at our church years and years ago, did one of our spiritual formation weekends, 
And for those of you who know Dale Bruner, you know he's one of the best Bible teachers in America. And we get to claim him as our own. He's Presbyterian. But he wrote a commentary on our gospel, the one we're studying today. It's this one. It's uh, called The Church Book. It's his commentary that's been republished in a new edition. And let me commend it to you. If you're looking for a, a wonderful, not cheap, a wonderful commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, Dale Bruner's your man. And um, guess where you can find it if you don't want to spend money? The church library. A shout out to the church library and Carol Thompson and Janet Schultz and all the rest who've made that a wonderful, very useful place. The church library is a special resource we have. Be sure to check it out. But here's what Dale Bruner says about Jesus, what we're thinking about this morning. He says this, Jesus is the suffering Christ. Oxymoron. Don't the words contradict each other? God's Christ comes, does he not, to end suffering, not endure it. He comes surely to win, not lose. And that was the expectation of Jews in first century Palestine at the time of Jesus. They wanted a Messiah who was a military political leader who would kick out the Romans, reestablish Israel's sovereignty, bring them back to glory, and uh, uh, fulfill God's kingdom purposes. And instead they got Jesus. I want to go back to our passage. I want to unlock some of, some of its riches for you. So let me go back and point out a few things that I think are worth paying attention to. The text starts out, from that time on. Well, Matthew's giving us a time stamp. What has just happened is Jesus has gone away on retreat with his disciples. He's gone all the way north to Caesarea Philippi, which is on the border with Lebanon. And it's a pagan place. And Jesus is on retreat with his disciples, and he says to them, hey, who do people say that I am? And they respond, well, some say you're Elijah, come back from the dead. Some say you're one of the prophets, et cetera, et cetera. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts out, as we know so well, many of us, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter gets this great endorsement from Jesus. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Truly, I tell you, you are Peter, Petros, the rock. And on this rock, I will establish my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. High point for Jesus, high point for Peter. And then we get this timestamp. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer well, that's off script, and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Listen to how Dale Bruner translates it. He must suffer at the hands of the lay leaders, the senior pastors, and the Bible teachers. Ouch. And that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. But watch how Peter responds. Peter took him aside. Now, he's going to say some hard words, Peter is to Jesus. Notice how he took him aside. This is a good model for us. If you have a hard word you feel you need to deliver to someone, don't confront them publicly. Take them aside. It's a gracious way to do that. It, it doesn't shame them. It gives it, you a chance to speak personally to them. It's a good example. So far, so good for Peter. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. Some translations have, God forbid, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. This is so off message, so off script, so off brand. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. We've already met Satan in chapter four, the tempter of Jesus. You are a stumbling block to me. Stumbling block in Greek, scandalon, word for scandal. A stumbling block is a, is a, is a stone you trip over. So he's saying basically, Rocky, you're the rock. You've just become a stumbling stone. And boy, what an interesting thing that is. Someone who's exalted to Christian ministry and leadership in just a moment has been reduced to something much less. It's a good reminder that leaders have clay feet. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
That's the problem. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? That's the word for life again. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul, for their life? And then a concluding statement. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus' favorite self-reference, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory at the end of time, judgment day, with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And at this point, all the Bible scholars are scratching their heads saying, what did you mean, Jesus? Because it sure looks as though he's saying, my great glory will come in your lifetime in the first century. Well, it didn't, unless that's not what exactly Jesus meant. He could have been referring to the resurrection, the transfiguration, which is our next passage, or even Pentecost, where the Spirit is poured out on the church. We're not sure what Jesus meant, but the rest of it, it's quite clear. We've got to give up our lives in order to gain them, the upside-down kingdom. And that's a hard word. Why do we find Jesus' teaching here so hard? I think it's this reason. Suffering and death threaten our impulse, our instinct toward life and comfort. So many things within us want life, want comfort. And when Jesus says that we must suffer and take up a cross, well, this is deeply threatening to us. It's repellent. We need to remember that Jesus is not a nihilist. Jesus does not have a death wish. Jesus is all about life. That's his whole point in coming. Remember, Jesus is the one who said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus is about something deeper here, and we need to pursue it. He's saying that one type of life we need to discard in order to have another type of life that's more fulfilling. We, Jesus is contrasting these two types of life. So let's begin by thinking, what kind of life are we to lose for Jesus? What's that one we need to discard? I think Jesus' teaching and the rest of the New Testament would indicate that it's a life in the flesh, which as someone once told me is self spelled backwards, sort of. It's a life where the self is on the throne. It's a self-centered life, a life of sin, which someone also once shared with me is S capital I N, where I, our egos, are in the middle of our existence. It's a life where self is God. And I love how Eugene Peterson translates these verses in a message. Listen to what he writes. Anyone who intends to come with me, says Jesus, has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me, and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. Wow. That is challenging. A lot of you have heard me uh, preach, uh, share about this in sermons in the past, but it's worth repeating, and I like to give a little background. My sister and her first husband were trained as missionaries to go to Central Asia years and years ago. And as part of their training, the agency they were working with gave them a cultural study on American, North American culture, our culture, and told them that we are characterized by a number of things and that uh, these are different from the countries we go to serve. And when I heard my sister talk about that, I thought, oh my goodness, that's so true. Those characterize my life. And so I've come to embrace, not embrace, but identify the four pillars of the kingdom of Carl, <laughs> also known as the four C's. See if you can relate to this. We North Americans, I'll just say I myself, prize control. We like to be in control. We prize comfort. We like to be comfortable. We prize convenience. We like things to work and easily for us. 
and we prize cleanliness. And the scary thing is, in my life, in our lives, we can often co-opt our religion in the service of these other ends. We can treat God as a genie in a bottle that if we rub God just right by our good behavior, he'll give us the four C's. A lot of people come to church for these reasons. And unfortunately, these can become idols in our lives and they enslave us. Jesus wants to free us. Dale Bruner, again, has such a good comment at this point. He says, at the last judgment, some of us will be dumbfounded to discover that what we thought was the innocent seeking of good and beautiful things for ourselves and our children, the four C's, was actually a whoring after alien gods and the use of religion to advance our status. Who of us can escape this indictment? Wow. Wow. Jesus, you see, wants to free us from this other life, this life that is focused on the kingdom of the self, and bring us into true life, fulfilling, lasting life, life that won't let us down. Again, Bruner is to the point with his next comment. Jesus is not anti our life. He's anti preoccupation with our life. Do you follow? When we turn our backs on our lives, surprise, we receive our lives. Make no mistake, Jesus is pro-life in the sense that he wants us to give up the false life and live into his true life, life indeed, a free, fulfilling, fearless life, a life that lasts. Because as you and I both know, if we've lived enough life, that trying to live in the driver's seat of your life only works for so long until you get the diagnosis, until your marriage falls apart, until you lose your job or all your money or your house burns down in a fire. We need another more durable kind of life. And that brings us to Lent. We're here to think about that over the 40-day period from now, now until Easter. What does Jesus say to us? What does he want us to focus on? Well, I need to be honest at this point and tell you that following Jesus is a gamble. Following Jesus is a gamble. We basically have to do this. Ante up our life, so-called, in a wager, a bet, that his life is far better. We've got we to be willing to put all our chips down on Jesus. And this is what he was talking about in a parable or two in Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. It was a wager, a wager that led to greater reward. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. It's a wager, a bet that we each are called to make. How many of you know the name Jim Elliott? Jim Elliott was one of the missionaries who went to bring the gospel to the Alca Indians in the 1950s in Ecuador. And Jim and a number of the other missionaries from Wheaton College were killed in the effort to do that, killed by the Alca Indians. But Jim Elliott is known for a quote that was popularized by his wife, and it's this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. We cannot keep the kingdom of the self, ultimately. It will not fulfill us. We're called to bargain and to wager that on this greater life that we cannot lose. Are you willing to do that? Have you done that? I don't think it's a once in a lot, once one time thing. I think we continue to continue to live into that. And, and discipleship is, a, is that trusting in Jesus for his leadership. And so I don't think it's a one time thing. I think it's an ongoing thing. Are we willing to do that? Lent asks us that question. All this brings me to where I find myself having lost our home in the Marshall Fire. And I now just have some questions that I'm asking myself and I wanna share these with you because I think they're bigger than I am. I'm being challenged to ask, what has defined my so-called life? We lost everything. 
We escaped with the clothes on our back and a few items in a suitcase and in our cars. What has defined my life? I thought about this as I lost all the books in my theological library. You know, a, a pastor's library is like a carpenter's tool bench. And I, I had a moment where I thought, can you still be a pastor without your tools? And I, 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 I'm having to ask these questions. And so when I'm stripped of these things, what of my core identity remains? And then a, a more positive question, perhaps, hard as it is, amidst all these losses, what are the potential gains? Where are the hidden blessings? How might this be a severe mercy? Those are my questions. I don't have a lot of answers, but those are the questions I'm asking. And I think ultimately they're questions we all ask as Jesus calls us to this other kind of life. Let me pray for you. Oh Lord, these are hard words, but you are a good and gracious savior. We know enough about that to trust you a bit, but we need to trust you more. And so we pray for this grace for you to help us to step into the life that is truly life indeed. Help us to keep our eyes on you as we continue the Lenten journey. In your name we pray, amen.